Welcome to the data science talks of the European Association for Data Science. This, in this video series, we will have the opportunity to interview researchers and practitioners in the field and hear their views uh, on current discussions and, and latest developments. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Peter Flach. He's a professor of uh, artificial intelligence at the University of Bristol and uh, an international leading uh, researcher uh, in classifier evaluation and calibration, human-centered knowledge uh, and intensive artificial intelligence and foundation of data science. Dr. Flach has also published on mining, high, uh, mining highly structured uh, data and on the methodology of data science. He's an author of highly cited papers of different topics uh, on machine learning and data mining, graph kernels, multi-instance kernels, performance measures, and a large list, a list of scientific papers. And his most uh, recent uh, book is Machine Learning, the Art and Science of Algorithms that Make Sense of Data from Cambridge University Press. Until 2020, Dr. Flagg was editor-in-chief uh, of the Machine Learning Journal. He has been program chair of relevant uh, conferences in the area, like the International Conference of uh, Inductive Logic Programming, the European Conference on Machine Learning, the ACM Conference of Knowledge Discovery and Data Mining, and others. And he's a fellow of uh, the Alan Turing Institute, Institute for Data Science and uh, in Artificial Intelligence. But of course, uh, I think it is interesting uh, to start this round of interviews and talks uh, on data science uh, with a founding member uh, and current president of the European Association for Data Science. Thank you, Peter, for opening this section of the European Association uh, for Data Science, where we talk uh, about a different aspects of current uh, trends and uh, we are looking forward to listening your ideas on the current state of the field. And uh, well, first, uh, just to start, uh, since, uh, since data science is such a broad field, we would like, to exp uh, we would like you to explain us uh, your vision of this area. Uh, there are plenty of definitions from different perspectives, um, uh, analytical, methodological, and computational. Um, so my question would be like, uh, would be, uh, what is data science for you? Hmm. Thank you. Thank you for the question, and and, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, um, yeah to to talk here. Um, so I think um, maybe I should start by saying a little bit where I'm coming from. So I was originally trained as an electrical engineer and then moved into computer science with, with an early interest in machine learning, actually. And, uh, but also keeping an eye on the broader pictures of human intelligence and how to emulate it on a computer and so on. So, so, so part of my work is up on machine learning. Part of my work is on artificial intelligence and 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 nowadays they they are almost some people see them as almost the same thing uh, whereas I, I i tend to distinguish between data driven ai which is more kind of machine learning and data science and knowledge driven ai which has more to do with with, with reasoning uh, and and how to combine these the, these two things, out of machine learning, which at some point became much more aligned with statistical goals like predicting, classifying, regression, those kind of things, then uh, a field emerged which was called data mining, which is basically kind of. Um, looking a little bit beyond pure prediction. And for example, a typical data mining task would be looking for patterns in the data. So what can you find? And so one way to think of that is that if you look for patterns, if you're trying to predict something, you've already fixed your dependent variable and you're looking for independent variables that maximally are maximally predictive. If you're looking for patterns, then you don't fix your dependent variable. You you kind of you know you you could say if A and B, then also C. But you could also have if C and not D, then E and not F, and those kind of things. So people started looking at association rules. I've I've done early work on mining 
dependencies in databases like functional dependencies and multi-value dependencies, which are not classification rules, which are constraints. So that was data mining um, that, that kind of came up in the late 90s, early 2000s, and is now a, a, a very well established field. And I think in data mining is different from machine learning because in data mining, we, 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 we pay more attention to pre-processing of data because we know that data doesn't come in nice forms that are easily represented by spreadsheets or comma-separated values. So in data mining, you have more attention to, to kind of the initial uh, part. How do you get the data in a form such that you can do your machine learning? And also, I think data mining naturally has a has a bit more attention for what do you do with the outcome of the mining process. So for example, if you do pattern discovery or association rule mining, you typically get thousands, if not millions of associations. So then you have kind of a post-processing stage where you, where you need to make sense of those, or maybe you want to visualize your data in a particular way. So I think data mining is kind of machine learning in the middle with, with stuff at the beginning and stuff at the end and you got methodologies like crisp dm mm -hmm. um, which basically tried to systematically go through that and you have business understanding you have data understanding then you do data preparation then you do modeling then you do evaluation how good is your model and then you do deployment and then maybe you go around this cycle a couple of times so um a couple of years ago uh, there was came out of a European project with 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 uh, colleagues in in Valencia and in Strasbourg. We looked more at data science, and we were thinking, well, is CRISPR-DM still suitable for data for data science, or it, or do we need to change? How do we need to change CRISPR-DM in order to um, uh, to get a methodology for data science. And that's where we hit the problem because um, our conclusion in the end was that data science is much more exploratory and it's much harder to come up with the kind of fixed methodology because uh, sometimes you want to do modeling, but sometimes you just want to look for the value in your data. So you, you have data, but you don't quite know what to do with it or what kind of value it is, or you don't quite know what kind of product you can build out of your data. So it's much more exploratory. So we try, we start to, um, to, um, to explore this idea of trajectory. So there are a number of things that you can do Modeling is one of them, but there are other things that you can do to extract the value from your data. And so a trajectory is, is a sequence through this space of different things that you can do uh, in order to extract more value. We wrote a paper about that, which was published in uh, IEEE Transactions on, on, uh, on knowledge, uh, Data and Knowledge Engineering, I think. Well, let me uh, say and, that, sorry, let, let me say that, uh, yes, the, this is part of the paper Chris PM, uh, 20 mm -hmm. years later, from data mining processes to data science trajectories. Mm -hmm. And actually, in the discussion of this paper, uh, I found one sentence that I liked a lot. Um, I have it here. So this is like the, the world today is a very different place from the world in which CRISPR-DM was conceived over two dec dec decades ago. No? Mm -hmm. And I, I, think, I think that it makes me wonder uh, what kind of different uh, projects, what kind of different uh, situation can we find so that now CRISPR-DM and it's not suitable for for our, or we need this kind of the, uh, this this new uh, data science trajectories. So I, I guess that because uh, from the beginning, I, I mean, you you have been talking about uh, some kind of methodological view, no? And because you talk about uh, machine learning, but machine learning was like a process. Then we need to add well, like, uh, we need to add more task to this process mm -hmm. before and after. No? Uh, mm -hmm. So we reach data mining. But, mm -hmm. uh, but data mining is uh, now uh, the, uh, the, uh, there is the same problem now. So uh, we, we need to incorporate uh, now new types of projects, new type of, uh, well, for example, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, legal uh, um, 
consequences of the, the, the use of the data, for example, mm -hmm. no? extracted from the process. So um, I mean that the point is that perhaps somehow the processes that we are getting or that we are uh, reaching uh, uh, are becoming obsolete because of uh, because of the advance of data science, no? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think that that's a valid point. And, and when we wrote that sentence, you know, that the world today is very different from, from 20 years ago. Um, it's about, um, so 20 years ago, you had, you know, you had a task, you wanted to achieve something and, and you had some data and you needed to get the data in the right form to, 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 to get the task. So the task came first or the business process came first, and then you looked for data that would help you to improve that business process. Nowadays, data often comes first. So you just have data. It's just a byproduct of what we do. Almost everything gets logged. There is so much more information on the web that you can scrape or you can look at Twitter or, you know, so, so data comes first. But often there isn't a clear task to 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 solve. And if there is, then CRISPM is still valid. If you still you know you have a clear idea what you're trying to achieve, you have the right data for that goal. So we're not saying that CRISPM is obsolete. But what we're saying is that in data science, uh, and you see this in universities, for example. I think universities are are, are a good place. So twenty years ago the history department or the language department didn't do data science. And, and they would be a bit surprised if you said, okay, why don't you use data? That's just not how they worked. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, you have things like digital humanities and you, you, know, you have data-driven history and, and, and people explore language in a much more data-driven way and so on. Um, and so that requires a different way of thinking. And, and I think we were a bit, we were very much influenced by statistics because, you know, in classical statistics, you want to avoid overfitting and you want to avoid, you know, fitting your model too much to the data. So a classical statistics is you first formulate a model, a hypothesis before you even look at the data. And then you basically um, in, interrogate the data to see whether your hypothesis is accepted or rejected and, and so on. And that's a very sound methodology, but you know, the world has changed. The reason that that methodology was there, we had very little data and we had a lot of possible hypotheses. So sort of mining in hypothesis space was a big no-no in statistics terms. They would talk about torturing the data until they confess, because, you know, if you have very little data, it can, it can, it can support almost any hypothesis. But now we're different. We have massive data. Uh, and, and so we don't have to be so concerned uh, that we are kind of overfitting the data. So, you know, I, I have colleagues in epidemiology that also talk about hypothesis-free uh, causal discovery, for example. So you, the methodology is important, um, but methodology is often, you know, it, it's easier to come up with the precise methodology if the, if the problem and the task is clearly defined. And, and I think the biggest thing that has changed is that we are much freer in sort of navigating that space. And that's what we were trying to, to underline in that paper. Yeah, in fact, in fact, I, I was thinking about, uh, well, in two separate lines, no? And first, first, you were talking about the uh, history departments or etc. I think it's data science or and this data meaning methods uh, in, uh, having these me methods incorporated into the uh, research methodology, the, the usual scientific methodology, or or it's just a complement. No, is that that would be my first question about what you have said, and the second question might be about the industrial application because many times it's, it happens in software engineering, for example. It happens that many times the um, uh, I, I'm not sure if project managers choose actually the best methodology for the project or the methodology is 
selected before uh, before the project, no, and and sometimes and I don't I don't know if uh, there is some kind of discrimination in in this field that we should uh, perform before uh, selecting the best uh, the best method to apply. Uh, I don't know, maybe maybe a pipeline, a, a specific pipeline, or, or or something. No, I don't know. Uh, I I had these two questions. No, about the academia view and the industrial view from your mm -hmm. from your words, actually. Yeah, yeah, it's it's they're they're excellent question. I'm not, I'm not sure if I have very clear answers to that, but um, I do think, sort of academically speaking. You know, you can view all these methods as kind of just a new string to your bow or a new tool in your toolbox. Or you can say, well, something quite fundamental is happening here. And I think your answer to that question depends on the field, I think. Um, if, let's say, you know, coming from a history of AI, you could see you could see AI as a kind of computational theory of mind, right? And philosophers, of course, this is, you know, classical, classical problems in philosophy. So, you know, what, 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 what can the human mind know and what can it not know and epistemology and so on. But of course, philosophers for, for, for 20 or 30 centuries did thought experiments, you know, sort of like Descartes thinking, you know, I think, therefore, I am. He was trying to think away everything else, all the sensory perception, and the one thing that he couldn't think away was was his own brain, and and that was that. And, but it was purely a thought experiment, and of course, now we can computationally realize things and build things, and what we find usually is that we can replicate sometimes very complex human behavior and you know things that we were convinced that only humans could do like playing mm. chess or go or actually the other day there is now a, a neuro symbolic system that has uh, has been able to beat humans at bridge which is a kind of you know that the, there are non-observable parts to bridge which makes it makes it different from go so um but what we find is we we discover methods to do these clever things but they are very different from the way that humans do it. And they require way more computational power and, and, and so on. But they are quite, quite fundamental. So that's kind of, I think, the academic viewpoint. But there are other areas that just, yeah, they, they, they carry on pretty much as they were before, but they use data science as, you know, an, an, an additional tool. Um, I think for in, in for, for industry projects, I think there is often, uh, how, how to express this? The, 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 I, often, I often see that people expect too much from data science. So, because, you know, just to, as a caricature, the kind of conversations that I sometimes have is that somebody comes to me with a problem and it's a really hard problem and they don't really know how to do it. And they don't even know how to start or how to, if, if, they, if they scale it down, they, they still wouldn't know how to do it. And then they say, well, I hear machine learning is great and can help me or data science or whatever. And, and I, I try to sort of manage their expectations there because you know I, I always have this silly example where I say, oh, okay, I want to predict, I have a coin here and I want to predict whether it comes up heads or tails. And I'm gonna do that with machine learning. So I'm going to toss it 10, 100, 1000, a million times and sort of I'm going to analyze that and then I'll build a predictor. And of course, you know, everybody knows that the predictor will be exactly as good or bad as it was after hundreds or a million data points as it was in the beginning, because this is a fundamentally 
random process. It's uh, statisticians would say it's a Bernoulli variable with the probability close to 0.5. The only thing that you can hope to do with data is have a have a better estimate of the probability of it coming up heads. Maybe it's a bit bent or a bit you know heavier on one side, and maybe the probability is 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 a bit different from 0.5. Um, so. So I use this example to, to, to show to people just the fact that you have data and that your problem looks like a data science project doesn't mean that data science can contribute anything there. So you need to have a reasonable belief that you have the right kind of data that contains a signal mm -hmm. that can help you to predict something. And in order to justify that belief you need to do some groundwork if if you have you know if you just say i have some data i have a problem now you can you help me to connect it to then i say well i'm not sure you yeah. know that's something so it's also i say this to students as well is kind of your hypothesis in you know you're not trying to solve a problem with data science or machine learning you're trying to assess how to what extent data science can help you to solve the problem and the answer may be well it can't because you don't have the right kind of data or the problem is too hard right so it's and i see that you know you talked about industry um yeah i i i think there is a bit sometimes a knowledge gap because you know, data science is, is very much in the news, machine learning is AI, and then there are unrealistic expectations. Yeah, completely agree. Actually, I, I found this situation as well. Um, when the, someone from the industry comes with the data and says, uh, well, I want to add value to my customers, so what can we do with this data? Uh, yeah, well, you you don't have uh, you don't have the the ball to to know <laughs> to uh, to guess what to do with the, the, their data. No, I mean it's a it's a complex problem because they, they first should have a clear what what are their business goals. No, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, they probably don't don't even have the, the their data with the, aligned with the, their business goals. So they have. Mm -hmm data uh, that they have been gathering uh, from different uh, relational databases and so on during the uh, along the years but uh, but they don't even have clear uh, what to do and that's that's a, i think it's a very common situation but right and maybe mm -hmm. that's, that's as i just said is maybe a question of expectation mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. yeah uh, I know one of uh, one project in healthcare for the people that they, they use cameras with very low resolution Mm -hmm. So that uh, they could not be somehow detect. Well, they could be detected, but not identified. Mm -hmm. And uh, and but but yes, actually, this is, this is a a point. You no, know, the, the the legal and the ethics uh, on and how intrusive your methods are in the in data science, even when you anonymize uh, your your um, your data, uh, if uh, they can be other uh, ethical uh, aspects. For example, I'm thinking about the gender in BS, no? for example, mm -hmm. uh, or, 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 some, or this kind of, of, of uh, uh, this kind of problems that uh, actually, well, I, I'm, I'm not sure that current methods are really prepared uh, for, uh, to, the, uh, to, to, to handle with these problems. Um, mm -hmm. um, you, you talked about that before from, a, I think, a more methodological uh, perspective, but mm -hmm. even from the execution of this uh, method, uh, the, of these processes. Um, I, know, I, I, I don't know your opinion about uh, how prepared are current methods to avoid these ethics, uh, uh, ethical problems, or I, 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 I'm thinking about the gender bias, but there are many others probably. Um, with, uh, I mean, are we prepared? No, I mean, there's a huge debate about particularly ethics of AI. Um, and it's and it's it's hugely important, but it, it has many different aspects that, you know, it, it's it that need to be sort of fleshed out a little bit. So first, I think, first of all, AI didn't invent ethics. Ethics existed before AI, and there are lots of other technologies that clearly have ethical implications or issues with fairness and discrimination and so on. Um, 
this is but but some of these are amplified by data driven uh, algorithms and so on. So that's my that's my first point. And the second point is yeah because if data is an intermediary, then you know the day if data is collected from what we do at the moment at the moment the world is not fair and sort of these kind of uh imbalances and unfairness will be captured in the data so if we then train our algorithms on that data then it's likely that these algorithms will amplify that as well so that is a specific thing to to AI and machine learning and data science. That, and that's something that we need to be aware of. So, so what's the goal here? So I would say we need to we, we need to start somewhere. And I would say it's already a good thing if the algorithm on the machine is not more unfair than we as humans. That would be a good starting point, right? And then we could maybe improve it and say, how do we get, how do we get better than humans? But it seems a bit hard to, on the one hand, say, well, yes, we accept that we humans are, there's a lot of unfairness and discrimination all the time, but, but the AI needs to be perfect. That's I think that's a recipe for failure, I think, because we, we don't know how to be perfect. And this goes back to, you know, why, why I think uh, people in, in, in are often over, in, as over uh, optimistic about what AI and machine learning can do. You need to be realistic. And let's start with a realistic goal, which is, you know, that the goal could be, let's first make sure that we don't make the world... Uh, an unfairer and more discriminatory place than it already is with AI. And, you know, once we are satisfied that we can do that, then we can maybe go beyond that. Although I also see the, the, the power and the promise of being really ambitious. But I think this is, this is worth, worth uh, uh, pointing out because AI on its own isn't going to solve all the unfairness in the world because you know yeah it, the first problem probably is uh, is uh, where do the data come from no? uh, mm -hmm. and how and, you and who, data who and selects the data, data you selects know data. and who pre-processes the data but you know there's kind of um so, so ethics is not in itself a technological problem and ethics also it is us as a society who need to who need to set the parameters, right? What what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, and then yeah. engineers like me can work with that. But just to give you one example, is um, some so let's say, and these are real examples, and these are really issues, right? So, for example, you know there may be systems that. I don't know, automatically detect faces or hands or so. And then when, you know, and they work, they have been, it turns out that they have been mostly trained on a particular demographic, let's say, you know, white middle-aged men. Okay. And some face recognition and the door opens for those persons and it also works perfectly. And then if for a different demographic, be it different skin color or different gender or, you know, different part of the world or whatever, it suddenly doesn't work. Obviously that is a problem. And obviously on the face of it, it's a fairness thing and it needs addressing. How to address it is not always very clear. For example, you could say, well, that's because your data set is not diverse enough. And so you need to have much more diverse data. Okay. But what may happen is if your, if your data is then kind of multimodal, you know, so you have distribution with different peaks. So here is the middle-aged white man, and we covered that. Here is the middle-aged women. It's quite close to it, but, you know, but here is people with different skin color or different body sizes or, or whatever. You could imagine that if you have a kind of very, you know, multimodal landscape, and by that I mean it has many kind of different peaks 
you know, of, of more dense characteristics. Training one model on such diverse data may actually result into something that doesn't work for any of these demographics. So now we went from something that worked for a particular demographic, but not for others, to something that doesn't work well for anybody. So my point being that, you know, there are technical arguments that then come into play. How are we going to solve this? So maybe the answer in that case might be we need one algorithm for middle-aged white men, we need another algorithm for women, we need another algorithm for babies, we need another algorithm for, you know, people from, from different parts of the world. And so, so, so it's, it's kind of sometimes people too easily identify or pinpoint the problem and say, oh, this is because, the, this is because it's a problem with the data. Well, Maybe it's a problem. Maybe the problem itself is so diverse that it needs many specialized algorithms to deal with all the special, all the different cases. And sometimes something is just an edge case that you just have to deal with as a special case because you know the algorithm overall works well, but there are some edge cases where it leads to an an. Uh, uh, un, unintended uh, and unfair consequences. So it's um, so there needs to be an interplay between what we want as society and what technology can deliver, and that needs to be kind of a two way two way communication. I think that that's, yeah, that's how I see the whole field. It it all came because um, we were talking about how data are used in sensitive domains. No? And we we were talking about. Uh, for example, medical doctors, and um, how do you how do you see the open up uh, of the citizen data scientists? Uh, because uh, I mean, this, this is where where people are able to deal with basic data science operations and transform or operate with their own data. And uh, do you think is this uh, feasible, uh, for, or do you think uh, it is realistic? Uh, is it realistic to think that somehow People will be able to make predictions by their own. Will, will be uh, will be uh, they will be capable of uh, using this uh, data science uh, methods by their own to, and, and extract useful and novel and significant value from them. Of course, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a really interesting question and and, and again a, a very multifaceted one. Um, I think. People need, um, people need to be educated more about what data science can and cannot do so that they are more realistic about it. Um, there is a push in the European Union to sort of uh, make sure that people have their own, have, have actually not just access to their own data, but but they can car they carry their own data with them. And if they change, let's say, internet provider, they you know they take away their data from one provider and potentially give it to another provider. I think that is incredibly hard to do, but you know that that's 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 one idea. Um, yeah, I think data science as such is um, it's a bit like with, again, taking COVID as an example, epidemiology. I mean, we, we can, and, and to some extent we have educated the, the general population and basic things to do with epidemiology. And for example, one difficult thing with COVID was the idea of exponential growth, right? So that, when you do exponential growth, it's, 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 you know, it's a multiplier every day. And actually a good metaphor for that is compound interest, right? So that's why, you know, even if you have a couple of percent interest rates, compound interest over 20 years gives you, gives you that kind of multiplicative effect. So, so I think it's important to, to give people insight in, in, in those basic concepts whether they can do data science themselves, well, 
maybe in, in simple forms, like simple regressions or so. But I think um, there's a lot of, uh, so people people want to learn, you know, deep learning or, or, or things like that, but they tend to skip a few steps in between. And so they make very basic mistakes you know, so so this is really what you want to what you want to avoid. You want to, I mean, a, a very useful question that I try to ask myself as much as possible is what can possibly go wrong, and then actually there's a lot that can go wrong, right? When you do data science naively, so it it yes, of course, I want I want to make it accessible to as many people as possible. But it's not an easy thing, you know. It's like yeah. so some some reasoning, you know, you need to be you need to be comfortable with Bayesian reasoning. I mean, even even people like you and me will sometimes make mistakes and then forget the base rate and then give the wrong answer and then we need some pen and paper. Say, oh yeah, of course, I forgot the base rate and this is actually the real answer. Mm -hmm. uh, that shows that these things are are yeah are are not intuitive and maybe our reptile brain <laughs> isn't really yeah. well fitted out for that kind of reasoning and 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 uh, so yeah we we again it's about managing expectations i think absolutely the basic concepts need to be need to be uh, 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 need to be taught but um yeah, whether sort of uh, data science becomes a, a completely democratic affair is is, yeah. is is quite a different thing, I think. So, based on your answer, maybe I'm, I'm thinking that uh, maybe the concept uh, this is which which is quite trendy, well, as many other concepts, uh, the citizen data scientist um, mm -hmm. is too ambitious no, yet, yet at the, uh, at, the at, at this point. Maybe we, we could start. I mean, maybe the explainable uh, artificial intelligence or what explain the explanation are doing. Maybe that's a good start. I mean, at least, mm -hmm. uh, well, do what what do what uh, I uh, as a data scientist I recommend you to do. But at least uh, the method. So you can use this method. But at least it, this method can be explained or will will mm -hmm. explain how it reached the conclusion. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe that's a. A good starting point, no? Uh, to a yeah, with yeah. I mean, you mentioned the concept of citizen data scientists. Actually, in the Sphere project, so this Smart House for Health Applications project, um, we had citizen data scientists because we developed a sensor platform and then installed it in people's home homes. So we had about. Uh, 50 homes, I think, in Bristol, which at some point collected data with our sensor platform. They were wearing a wearable. They had cameras in various places. They, we had wireless access points. And so the, 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 the wearable was speaking to the wireless access point with, with tri tri triangulation. We could then figure out what where they were and they would provide us with some ground truth and so on. Um, and this was this was then stored on a hard disk, and every three months we would sort of, you know, uh, collect the hard disk and and replace it with with the new one, and and so on. So I think there the citizen data scientist is is somebody who helps with the collection of the data, data that otherwise would not be easy to 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 get, right? And of course we had. Um, we had meetings. This is my uh, my clock beating uh, two p.m. Uh, we had meetings with uh, with them because, of course, they they wanted to know what we did with the data and and what we and because it was quite open ended, we we couldn't always answer that question. But we, one thing that they found re really useful is visualizing the data. So I was like, okay, look, last month this is kind of your month in one graph and these are the kind of kind of conclusions that i draw from that uh and sort of you know maybe oh i see that uh, you know maybe you were away for a week here or here your kind of regular sleeping pattern was a bit uh, disturbed so maybe maybe you had guests there or or whatever you know so so 
people were very interested in that kind of feedback of us just giving them some idea what does data even look like and 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 what can you conclude from that even just by just by looking at the data not even running complicated algorithms over that um, so I think that concept of a citizen data scientist is useful, I think. So to collecting high quality data, which, which with, um, with some ground truth as well, because I think these days what is really, so data is cheap, but labeled data is expensive so that you have ground truth that you know what is going on. And, and I think that's where citizen data scientists could, could play an important role. Yeah, um, there is, a, I, I think, in my opinion, there is a, another factor that this is probably also related to this uh, point, because this is the lack of data professionals, the, the lack of, I mean, uh, uh, the lack of data scientists in the industry. Um, there, uh, well, you know, there's a, actually a problem in the, in the professional market, no, in the industry. Uh, because uh, the, the professionals need a specialization, uh, they are highly demanded. Um, so um, probably th this could be somehow a, a, a way to solve this uh, this demand, no? or to, to this this lack of professional is just to uh, move the responsibility to the citizen, no? so the, <laughs> to the end user, no? and uh, okay. <laughs> Do it, by, do it by your own, no? and uh, do it by yourself, no? Um, so, um, and in, in this case, uh, in talking about these uh, professionals, uh, what advice uh, would you give to someone who wants to start out uh, as a data scientist? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I think we we need to be careful not to. So I think what often uh, is a bit of a fallacy in these kind of discussions is that so we talk about what you know what what are important aspects of a data science role. The fallacy is often that we tr <clears throat> try to project that onto a single person, and then we get the kind of unicorn. We get somebody who needs to have um, have so many skills that no single person has that right so so that can easily be um addressed by by talking about a, a team rather than a single person and suddenly yes. the venn diagram you're not looking for the intersection you're just making sure that the whole union is sufficiently covered by your team exactly. right? so so i think the direction of travel here is that there are different roles in in data science so you know there there could be a data engineer so somebody who basically um, makes sure that the data is kept in good health is accessible and and we have all the infrastructure that that, that comes with that uh, an important role that that is emerging is is the role of somebody who 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 does ML ops, so machine learning operational, you know, and this is this is this comes from the term DevOps, which is sort of somebody who doesn't necessarily uh, develop the algorithms, but once the algorithm have been developed, make sure that they keep running and that the hardware keeps up to date and that it keeps being monitored and so on. That emerged as an important separate separate task and it's different from the programmer's task so you have something like that in in machine learning and data science as well where you know you need you need to make sure that everything runs correctly you need to do regular checks you need to you need to make sure that the algorithm doesn't you know run run away you know in a way that it starts making the wrong predictions and so on um so but what i i still think that because i think uh, what you hear most commonly from industry data scientists is that kind of you know it's a lot less glamorous than what people think so you know there, there was this phrase data scientist that the sexiest job in the 21st century and that's it yes there is a lot of scope for data scientists 
a lot of it is just making your hands dirty and looking at actual data and yeah. sort of and and also when you run your algorithms trying to you know stress test them and sort of try to find mistakes in the algorithms results and so on right so so that is kind of uh, you know there's, there's plenty of people who would who would really enjoy doing that but that is kind of an, an industrial uh, data science job or when industry i mean it's also in insurance or in you know health related companies or in 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 retail or whatever it's a bit like you know okay being an accountant is not all about spreadsheets but if you don't like spreadsheets then probably <laughs> accountant is not the right job for you right so data scientists if you don't really like looking and playing with data and looking at results and trying different things then maybe this is not the job for you of course if you're in one of the big tech companies amazon google and so on i mean they can offer something that nobody else can offer which is that actually your algorithms in the end are being tried out on billions of people so you know that 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 counts for something as well. So it's it's a really interesting time, I think, to be a data scientist. But I would recommend people to to think a little bit about those kind of issues. What do they like most? What's the kind of thing that they that they that they like doing, and then base their choice on that. Yeah, actually, well, many of many universities. I'm sure that the University of Bristol Law does, and the University of Cordoba. I'm, I'm actually. Uh, the head of the master in data science and, and the online master. And uh, we have people, students from actually uh, many, many diverse uh, disciplines, even they are not computational, but uh, they, are, they look for, I don't know, maybe there's a question of expectations, as you said before, no? I, I, maybe they, maybe they, are, they are looking to complement their studies and try to, and they, they somehow uh, guess that if they, learn about data science that they will be able to or they will be fully capable of mixing their world both world, no, worlds mm -hmm. no, and, and it can be but probably it's not this the the reality afterwards but but uh, as you said actually it's a and that makes me wonder about the alignment between academia and industry that you have mentioned okay? because uh, um uh, not uh, not only from the uh, uh, from the educational perspective, but also from the practical pr perspective. How, how do you see their path uh, going in the future? Because depending on the topic, uh, industry has taken uh, the lead uh, in this field. I, 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 it's fine, it's good. Uh, but I, I'm thinking about uh, I don't know DeepMind or uh, quantum computers or etc. Um, uh, but does this affect the vision of each other? They have each other, uh, or how necessary is the cooperation uh, for what? Um, how do you see this uh, this point? Is, po is this possible a real cooperation uh, in, in this uh, at, at, at this moment? Hmm. Yeah, um, it's. I think it's both very interesting, but I'm a little bit worried as well because so to begin with moving things that are initially pure research to industrial r d to deployment and so on is perfectly natural and that happened many times right so you know computer hardware is a case in point or um, computer graphics you know the kind of the techniques that are being used now um were were purely research uh, items just a couple of decades ago so that there's nothing wrong with that and that is to be expected mm -hmm. um what i think is different with kind of when we talk about the big tech companies is that um they hold a lot of cards so you know I can't get access to Google or Facebook data, even if I collaborated with them, even if I signed an NDA or something. It's you know, so 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 they have data that we don't have access to. Because of their size, they have huge compute resources, uh, and. Um, 
they're with those things, they do things that now dominate the research agenda. So, um, you know, we have things like language models, or some people call them foundation models, like GPT-3, sort of a huge language model. I even if I had the university supercomputer to myself, I couldn't, I, I couldn't dream of, of, of doing what they are doing, okay? Um, and, um, and, and that's in itself not, not wrong, but I think it is a matter of balance. So all these things are kind of a matter of balance. So you want to find a good model where sort of tech industry and universities can kind of coexist and sort of, both have their their kind of kind of uh, kind of niche, and I think what 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 you can easily see happening is so. This, I mentioned healthcare before, and I, I meant and I mentioned education, which I think is another really interesting area: AI and data science for education. So, but um, you can immediately see that a company like Amazon would be very interested in healthcare because it would be another channel to to sell products to people and to you know and to deal with the logistics of that and again you know that's not in itself necessarily wrong but there comes a point where you know already if if, if you were to come to me Raul, and said i want to do a phd on search engines then i would say well don't do that do you want to compete with google that is probably not a great idea right so so there are clearly no go areas in research that have been monopolized by industry and so then we move to something like healthcare until um, you know, a company like Amazon uh, gets interested in that as well. And then, you know, there might be a situation where the kind of academic research that we do is so niche that, you know, and it is, it is, uh, um, so that's one side of things. And, uh, you know, um, universities need resources as well. We need resources, we need students. And it's already happening that undergraduates think, hmm, I can actually get a job at big company or at startup XYZ, I, I get a very good salary, or I can go and do a PhD and for very little money, you know, sweat a lot for four years. And I think, you know, a lot of people now take a different decision than they would be taking 20 years ago. So there is, my nightmare scenario here is that um, in 10 years time, you know, universities have been bled dry a bit. They, they don't have the resources there. Right? You know, the, the people who are there are maybe not, not the best people for the topic. They are struggling to get students. They're struggling to educate people, which, in the end will be detrimental to the tech companies as well, right? Because they rely on well-educated people. So, um, so I'm just hoping that uh, sufficiently many people take a longer term perspective and think kind of 10 years ahead and sort of not, not just try to, try to do what's in their best interest now uh, but also look 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 further ahead. Um, industry university collaboration is is a good thing. In my experience, a lot of industries, if a topic is sufficiently important for them, they want to do it themselves because then they don't have to deal with non-disclosure agreements and so on. And you know, it's kind of a way of de-risking de-risking mm. that. So. There's a lot of programs, Google sponsoring universities, Amazon, because they are worldwide programs, um, they are very competitive and they're not very transparent as to how many do they actually award and so on. So to be absolutely honest, Raul, I, yeah, I, I, uh, I, compete a lot less in those kind of programs than I did before because it's a lot of work and and, and the success rate from what I can see is is quite low. So so this this area definitely needs work. 
I am leading uh, what in uh, Britain is called the Center for Doctoral Training. So um, that's a center that is funded by research councils, but also with, with industry funding. Um, every year we have a cohort of 10 PhD students. We give them kind of one, one, one year training in, uh, in, in what we call interactive AI. So it's kind of human in the loop AI, but it also has, has, has data science and other things. And so the idea is that these people will do a PhD for four years and, and they will then enter the job market to, to, to deal with the skills gap. You know, we don't have enough highly qualified people there. So when I talk to industry partners and we have a lot of industry partners, I'm telling them, look, you want to be part of this because you want to encourage this, this kind of ecosystem. Don't expect kind of, yes, you can sponsor a PhD student and you can work with them, but that's not cheap labor for you. You know, the real benefit comes at the end of the four years. So, 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 so that's one way of kind of building an ecosystem where, where academia and industry can kind of work together to make sure that there is a sufficient pipeline of, of talent and, and, and people entering the job market. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I would like to move to the end of this uh, talk by... Mm by looking to the future actually it's like uh, uh like the students we were talking about no if uh, if you had to propose a topic for debate because we, we have been talking about many many things uh, uh and, and from from the ethics and legal, and legal to the citizens to the role of the user to to the industry i mean we have been talking about many things and if you had to propose one topic uh and of, for debate in the on data science today no? right now what, uh, what would it be? I think I would concentrate on the role of the human, of us in all of this. I mean, we talked about expectations a, a couple of times, but um, my view has changed a lot when, uh, when I read uh, Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, where I realized that... Um, you know, people are risk averse in certain situations and risk seeking in other situations. So for example, if we agree to play a game, we roll a die. If you roll six, then I give you 60, 60 euros or I can give you 10 euros now, okay? So the expected value of the two outcomes is the same because on average, you know, there's one six probability that you roll a six and then you get 60 euros. So that's one six times 60 is also 10 euros. So, but in that situation, more people will choose the 10 euros because they think, oh, well, you know, it's only one six probability that I will get the six. So I, I better get the 10. If you, if you revert the game and say, well, um, either you pay me 10 euros now or we roll the die and you only have to pay when you roll a six, but then you have to pay me 60 euros. Then more people are risk seeking, which is kind of interesting. I don't think it's right or wrong. It's just a pattern, a reproducible pattern in, in human, human uh, psychology. And there are many such patterns. There are many biases, confirmation bias. There is, you know, the availability heuristic that people make basic mistakes with basic probability theory because, you know, so, uh, and I think these things are important because whenever there is a human in the process, they have this kind of, they have these biases, they have these heuristics and, and so on. So I think what we, there's a lot of discussion, particularly in AI about autonomous AI and robots that are going to destroy the world and autonomous cars. I think the real future is trying to make humans and machines and algorithms work together. And that's also in data science. So, so, so. Well, human is everywhere. <laughs> yes. Human is everywhere. Oh, and, and data science is for humans and about humans, and humans produce the data, but they come with their expectations, they come with their goals. Uh, and so, I mean, it's not, 
it's not really a well crystallized topic for debates, but I would like to have much more of a, of, of, of a light shining on what different roles can humans play in this ecosystem? Because I really see it as an ecosystem. There are, as you say, there are people everywhere. They have roles. So let's clarify the roles that people have and then what are their objectives in their roles? What are the expectations in their roles? What are, what are those biases? And then so uh, make sure that the algorithm and the humans, you know, that the algorithms take sufficient account of the goals of the humans, but the humans also take sufficient account of the, 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 the scope and limitations of the algorithms, right? So it, it's really about, yeah, it's not, oh, I just, the algorithm is working by its own and I wait until it does its thing and then, then I get the fantastic result. It's, we have a role to play in there as data producers, as, 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 as people who are trying to achieve particular things, uh, people who put constraints on the whole process in terms of ethics, in terms of fairness and so on. So I think that that is, it, it's not a very precise answer to that question, but I, I would be a big advocate to, to kind of uh, try and address the, the issue of data science, data science for, with, and about humans, that that would be kind of my my suggestion yeah. for a debate. There are many open fields actually, but uh, in this case, I uh, agree with you actually. Mm. So before saying uh, goodbye, I would like to take advantage now to benefit that uh, of the fact that you are the president of the European Association <laughs> for Data Science. So uh, I would like uh, to know if you could could you tell us more about the association so that uh, for you. Sure. Uh, yeah, I have been uh, I have been president since uh, I think for, for for just over three years. I think um, it's a young association. Um, I think our our main um, yeah objective is to be inclusive and to have a, a very broad uh, notion of data science. So. Uh, Actually, which means that you know many people have their own view of what data science is, and, and all those people are welcome in our association. Also, it's not a purely academic association. It, it, we want to have industry partners as well. Uh, we are currently quite the, the association started in Luxembourg, so we're, we're kind of quite heavily represented around that area. Uh, but we, yeah, we we want to we want to have a better a coverage of, of, of Europe. But it's really about, um, yeah, getting people talking to each other and, and sort of distributing, of, 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 uh, promoting awareness of issues in data science, opportunities, projects, uh, job markets. Uh, in some sense, it is, you know, what, what, what many professional organizations are trying to do. Um, it's not always easy in this day and age where, you know, it's kind of people, again, have an expectation that things should be online and free and, uh, and, and so on. But uh, what has been very successful, and we are running another one in, uh, in, in this summer, um, is a summer school. So uh, this time we previously we had the summer school on, on explainability and interpretability in data science. This year we have a summer school on social network analysis that will be in person in, uh, in Luxembourg uh, because we, yeah, I mean, there are many events that are being held online, but if you want to promote people talking to each other and exchanging ideas. There's really no replace, no substitute for an in-person meeting. So we have delayed our plans a couple of times because of the pandemic, but now fingers crossed uh, this, this, will, this will happen this summer. And we are, uh, so it's in Luxembourg, the details are on, the, on our website. And uh, it's preceded by a public event. Uh, we we uh, we have uh, we've had several of these public events. Uh, they were um, we started to organizing uh, them to honor our founding president, uh, Professor Sabine Krolak-Schwert, who 
unfortunately passed away uh, in 2016, I think, and to honor her because she has been really very, uh, very, very active in setting up the association. We have, uh, we have the uh, Sabine krolak schwert lecture. Um, and so uh, this year the lecture will be given by uh, Professor Miraya Hildebrandt, who is, uh, who is, who is uh, uh, a well-known scholar in kind of the, the very interesting interaction between data science and computer science. So it's kind of, the, the, she talks about the rule of law, but of course, computer scientists also have rule-based systems and so on. So she's, she's really, she's, uh, she's an excellent speaker to, 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 and, and a deep thinker to talk, about, uh, to talk about things associated with that. So, you know, clearly computer science will have an impact on the way we do law and the legal profession, but conversely, laws provide constraints on what we can do with computers. And that, that, that's a really interesting uh, interaction. So I'm looking very much forward to, uh, to, that, uh, to that lecture. Okay. Well, thank you so much for, for your time. And uh, I appreciate it. Um, uh, I, ho I, I hope that our, our viewers are happy with uh, our talk. And <laughs> I think we have been talking about many, many things. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you so much, Peter, for your time. Okay. Yeah, my pleasure. And thank you for the, for the really uh, interesting and thought-provoking uh, questions. Uh, okay. Hope to see you in person soon. Okay, bye-bye. Okay.